All right, Alexander, let's uh, talk about the massive uh, celebration, the 300 years of Romanov rule. And uh, it wasn't really just like a one night celebration. This is kind of a tour of Russia and uh, took them all over the, the massive country and uh, eventually even to, to Moscow, big celebrations in, uh, in Moscow, St. Petersburg. Uh, what do you make of this? I mean, we'll, we'll start off with, with, uh, with a ce celebratory um, angle first before we get into some of the more serious stuff that is uh, taking place. So 300 years of Romanov rule. I think what it was intended to show, and I think what he does actually reflect, is growing self-confidence at the centre of the government, at the centre of power. I mean, bear in mind, there's been a very rocky period in Russia since basically 1904 when Japan uh, launched an attack on Russia and that led to a war, the Russo-Japanese War, which had many, many problems for Russia, many setbacks. It ended in a compromise, but, you know, it was uh, the perceptions were coloured by the various Russian defeats that took place in the war rather than the fact that it ended in a, essentially a stalemate. Then we had the political crisis, which many people call the 1905 revolution. We've covered that in detail. We then had um, all, uh, you know, the assassination of the very successful prime minister um, that the Tsar appointed, Pyotr Stolypin, who managed to stabilise the situation. But it's fair to say that since Stolypin's murder in 1911, and perhaps to some people's surprise, things on the surface, at least, have appeared fairly peaceful and fairly orderly. So on the one hand, you get the sense that the Tsar and his officials, the people close to him and his family, perhaps his immediate family, feel that uh, finally the bad days have passed. The situation is now under control. The economy is booming. Um, the recession that was such a problem for Russia um, in the immediate years after the millennium, the, 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 sorry, the start of the new century, that that has passed and that the economy is now booming, living standards are rising, industrial growth is increasing, agricultural production is rising. So there's a sense of things going well and according to plan, and for the for the reason for that reason, the Tsar had this massive celebration, both to show his confidence, his feeling that things are now going in his favour, but also in a way in in order to renew his connection to the Russian people. And of course, the point about it, the most important part of this celebration were not these. Um, uh, big pompous ceremonies that took place in St. Petersburg and Moscow. I should say that no court does that kind of thing, these big, massive showcase celebrations. No court does those as well as the Russian court does. I mean, the Russians are the great masters of ceremony and pomp and circumstance. I mean, they put the British, for example, completely to shade in this sort of thing. But the most important part of it was the tour of Russia, of the tour of the provinces, of the Tsar meeting his people. He was enthusiastically received in most places. It's the sense that the Tsar is once more fully in control, fully in charge, and he's bond with his people after all the early crises at the start of this century that they've all been resolved. So it was, it was, an, it was a demonstration of confidence of confidence in the future, of confidence in the present, that the situation in Russia is stable, that the government is fully in control, that the Tsar has things under fully under control. And as a result, it was both a celebration of that achievement of stability and of prosperity and a sign of confidence of things to come. It wasn't all good, though, the, the past year. Um, you did have the massacre at uh, the Lena gold mine, and that did not turn out well. Um, some reports, I mean, 250 people 
reported dead, another 250, 300 uh, injured. This was not good. It was not, uh, not another good look for the Tsar. And um, the, what he's doing is, is every time you have one of these flare-ups and it ends with this type of tragedy, it just kind of, you know, fuels the, the, the flames of, of revolution and, and regime change and a lot of the, the radical left forces who want to do away with, with the monarch. How did he, why did this happen? Why did the massacre happen in, uh, in the gold mine? And how did the Tsar manage to, to get past that so that yeah. he could get to the, to the celebrations, to 300 year celebrations? I, 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 you're right. I'm glad you brought up the Lena massacre because this is a very important event. And I think this is perhaps points to some of the underlying problems. Because though it seems to be true that the Tsar as the, the Tsar's position now looks much more consolidated than it ever has done, more consolidated perhaps even than it did at the start of his reign in the 1890s when he was very much dominated by his brothers uh, and his uncles. I mean, you know, the, the whole family were basically trying to bully him into policies. So he, wasn't, he didn't seem a particularly strong and secure ruler at that time. And then he had all of these crises that followed, even though he looks in a stronger position now than he has ever done. Many of the underlying weaknesses are still there. Firstly, it's true, I think, that he has managed to win back, claw back a lot of support amongst the the, uh, rural population, who it should be said still accounts for something like 80% of Russia's total population. As I said, there's um, an agricultural boom underway. Living standards in the countryside have improved. um, And there is a sense that people in the provinces, in the rural areas, are prepared to some extent at least to renew their uh, bond with, with the sovereign. But there remain crucial elements in Russian society, which for the moment the Tsar is unable to reach. Now, one of them is the industrial working class, and we've seen constant flare-ups of strikes and protests taking place in Russian factories and in Russian industrial regions. And we also are getting an increasing sense that on the part of the industrial working class, there is growing the growing influence of the best organised and in some ways most militant party of all, which is the Bolshevik party led by the man who calls himself Lenin. And his influence and his organisation seems to be growing. He's got by far the best organisation amongst all the revolutionary parties, He's got all sorts of people who are uh, working for him in all sorts of places. And the influence and reach of that organisation is now extending to all parts of industrial working class Russia. It's no longer as it was, say, in 1905, when the Bolsheviks were primarily strong in the big cities in St. Petersburg and in Moscow. They're now uh, they've now developed a very strong organisation in the Urals, in the Caucasus, in the Baku oil fields, and also in the region of the Liena River, where these gold mines are located. Now, bear in mind that the leader of this organisation calls calls himself Lenin. His true name is Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov, but he's increasingly calling himself Nikolai Lenin, or just increasingly just Lenin. And of course, the question often is asked, why does he use this name? And many people believe that he has adopted the name Lenin because he's connecting himself both to the revolutionary exiles who are sent to places like Siberia, or, you know, to exile in Siberia, many of these exile colonies being along the Liena River, which is in Siberia, but also that he's doing it 
out of some sort of gesture of solidarity to the workers who work often in very tough conditions in the gold fields there. So you can see Lena, Lenin, and in fact we learn that the Bolshevik party, its organisation, now extends even into Siberia, even into places like the Lena gold fields. But there is another factor at play as well, because what we also see is that the people who own these factories, who own these gold mines, many of them sometimes are not entirely averse to seeing Bolsh uh, Lenin's Bolshevik organisation expand in these places, because, of course, they are implacable opponents of the Tsar. Either they want to overthrow the monarchy entirely, if they are extreme liberals, and there are some who do, or they are people who perhaps do not want to overthrow the monarchy, but want to replace Nicholas with someone more pliable. Now, it's difficult to know exactly what did happen at the Lena Goldfields, but a few things need to be said. Firstly, working conditions in these mines are extremely tough. Secondly, the, the company that owns these mines is controlled by people who are Nicholas's political opponents. Amongst them is Sergei Vitter, who is the former prime minister and finance minister, who played an instrumental role in creating the Duma in conditions setting up a universal suffrage situation, which many people at the time thought was misconceived, and who pushed the Tsar into concessions towards the Liberals during the 1905-1906 crisis, which many people see as unwise. And there are other Liberals also who seem to have been involved heavily in uh, owning shares in these particular gold mines. Another person who seems to have owned shares in these gold mines is the Tsar's mother, the Empress, the Dowager Empress, who at the moment has a difficult re re relationship with the Tsar himself and who um, is on extremely bad terms with the Tsar's wife and is known to favour some sort of outreach to the liberal opposition and has apparently been looking around amongst her other sons, or so the rumour says, for possible replacements for Nicholas, who she's clearly finding, uh, clearly becoming increasingly um, alienated from. So one has to say with these kind of crises, these protests that happen, like the one that happened at the Lena Goldfields, that it was, um, they look like, on the one hand, a simple industrial dispute that gets out of control, but there may be factors underlying it, organisation by the Bolsheviks, in the gold fields, uh, complicity to some extent in a strike carried out by the, the liberal owners of the gold fields who want to unsettle the situation in the country so as to force extract concessions from the Tsar. You, you, and it always looks like it's much more complicated than it might be. In addition, and this is perhaps something else that this affair highlights, it's that Russia still hasn't organised a proper police force. I mean by that a police force with riot police, people like that, like you already have in Germany, for example, who when uh, strikes get out of hand, when they're big protests, when lots of people come out on the streets, they can come in and can bring a situation under control. What happens instead is that the army gets called in, very junior officers take charge, sometimes they panic, and one senses that partly this is what happened in this particular event. Now, there is another factor in it, because, of course, Nicholas himself had no direct involvement in what happened in the Lena Gold Fields. He wasn't involved at all. He wasn't concerned about it. But the Liberals, who are still very strong in the Duma, managed to 
take control of the investigation. And they put one of their own people in charge. And this is a fiery lawyer, uh, a person with an extraordinary reputation for manipulating information and, frankly, for fa inventing fantastic stories and who is never to be relied upon uh, um, when he conducts investigations. He, is, he, is the, he chaired a committee which, as I said, leaked lots of information about this investigation into the Lena, on, into the Lena Gold, Goldfields to the media and has done so in a way that seems intended to cause the most damage to the Tsar himself and to the government, even though they were not directly involved. And this individual is somebody who, as I said, is a master at this sort of thing, manipulating the media. Bear in mind the media is controlled by the liberals, leaking critical information to the media, spreading stories, um, you know, fantastic often and untrue stories. And he's a lawyer and he's got all those sort of skills that come with that sort of thing. And his name, by the way, is Alexander Kerensky. And many people think that he's going to become a major figure in Russian politics. And he's certainly angling to be that. Though I know lots of people who think that he is unstable and unreliable and absolutely not to be trusted. And that the, the way in which he's manipulated this episode in the Lena Goldfields on behalf of the Liberals, that that shows that he's not to be trusted. Yeah. Kerensky's name is is making the rounds, but um, it seems like the the celebration, this three hundred year celebration, um, to me, it seems like the Tsar and his, and his family are are not aware as to what's going on inside of Russia. I mean, maybe they are, and they're just putting on a good face, but um, you have a lot of problems that are going on, and you just outlined a lot of them with regards to to Lenin and and the left, uh, the radical left forces that, that continue to gain power. Um, you also have, and we'll get to this probably at the final segment of the video, you have the continuing rise of Rasputin, and we're going to have to talk about him again. It seems every video we're doing more and more, uh, we're dedicating more and more time to Rasputin because to me at least, with each passing month, he's gaining more and more power. And with the power that it seems he's getting, the influence, I won't say power, more and more influence, the closer he is getting to the royal family, the more damage he's doing to the royal family, given his extracurricular activities. And I'm, and I'm being very diplomatic here. I'm being very polite to our uh, viewers not to get into the details of, as to what Rasputin is, uh, is rumored to do outside of the, of the palace. So before we get into Rasputin and some other scandals going on with, uh, once more, really, really bad press with, uh, with regards to Rasputin and the royal family, you'll get into that. Let's touch upon what's going on outside of Russia, because while it seems that Tsar and his family are having this big celebration, and to me, it seems like they may be obliv oblivious to the real problems inside the country, or once again, maybe they're just putting on a good face, it looks like outside of Russia... We're going to uh, to war, and it looks well, like the, the the central focus is once again like as we touched on in our previous video, we're looking at tensions between Serbia, the Balkans, and um, Austria Hungary and Germany. It seems Germany is is moving more and more in support of uh, the Austria Hungarian Empire. On the flip side, it also seems like the ambassador in um, in Serbia is creating his own alliances with regards to, to many Balkan nations. Serbia, Greece, getting very close. Um, Bulgaria kind of floats in and out. But alliances are deepening and tensions are also deepening. What is going on outside of, uh, of Russia? And then we'll shift focuses back to inside with Rasputin. Absolutely. Now, I think this is, in fact, in, in many ways, a very difficult and dangerous situation because what is happening is that the Russians have ultimately gained, if you like, they've avenged themselves for the humiliation they experienced in the Bosnian crisis. But it may be at a very high price to themselves 
which has actually deepened the tensions in Europe. Now, let's just go back and recall what happened during the Bosnian crisis, which is, in my opinion, the origin point of this thing. Austria-Hungary unilaterally annexed Bosnia, which is a territory occupied by Serbs, but which the uh, Austro-Hungarian Austro -Hungarian Empire has occupied for many years. And they blackmailed the Russians by pretending or claiming that the Russians had in some way consented to this in a, a, a private meeting between the Russian foreign minister, a man called Izvolsky, and the Austrian foreign minister, a man called Erenthal, something which is completely not true. There was supposed to be an international conference in order to try to settle this problem in a way that looked at least satisfied Serb aspirations. But the Germans weighed in very strongly on Austria's side. And Stalipin, who was absolutely in charge of the situation at that time in Russia, said, look, Russia cannot afford a war. We've just come out of a difficult war with Japan. We've had a political crisis on our hands. We cannot afford a war now. He's anyway somebody who he was anyway somebody who didn't want wars. He wanted to consolidate and strengthen Russia. So he prevailed in the political battles in St. Petersburg. And as a result, the Russians backed down. War was avoided. The economy, as I said, continued to boom. The military continued to grow in strength. But there was a widespread perception in Russia that Russia had been humiliated by Germany. So public opinion in Russia, which does matter. I mean, it's extensive. There's a very strong Russian media. There's lots of people. There's a, there's a large Russian political class. They were very angry at the way in which Germany and Austria had ganged up against Russia during the Bosnian crisis and at the way in which Austria tried to blackmail uh, Russia. And they were, out, they were out for revenge. At the same time, the more moderate figures in the government, people like Krivoshein and Kokosev in the cabinet, who want to follow Stolypin's line, also wanted to pursue peace. So they set up a meeting between um, Nicholas and the German emperor, Wilhelm, uh, in Potsdam, which is this German palace, the Prussian palace near Berlin. And this is supposed to try to tidy up the crisis that was con con uh, uh, resulted from German-Russian relations as a result of this Bosnian crisis. And this meeting happened in 1910, and to all appearances, it seemed to go well. And it looked as if, for a time, the situation in Europe was stabilising. Unfortunately, Wilhelm is a very volatile personality, and on top of that, he has to take into account various pressures within Germany itself. And he then completely wrecked this reconciliation with Russia, which was looked like it was happening in uh, um, yeah, and which had been agreed in Potsdam by sending military advisors and arms to the to the Turks, to the Turkish government. And he seemed to be siding with Turkey, which is, of course, Russia's perennial enemy. He seemed to be siding with Turkey against Russia. So this reconciliation that seemed to be underway, it almost immediately broke down. Now, at the same time, as I said, as the people who advocate a policy of peace, people like um, Kokovtsev, the prime minister, Krivoshein, the minister of agriculture, Peter Balk, the finance minister, um, and Sazonov, the, fa the foreign minister, were trying to sort of patch up things with Germany. They had to patch up things, the Russians had to patch up things with Serbia. So they sent to Serbia one of their most hardline, toughest, and most brilliant diplomats. This is a man called Nicholas Hartwig, who, despite the fact that he's obviously of German extraction, as his name shows, is somebody who passionately believes in Russia's uh, mission to defend the Slavs. And Hartwig was sent to Belgrade. 
And most people agree that he did a brilliant job in restoring Russian prestige and influence in Belgrade after the Bosnian crisis, where, of course, Russia felt, was felt by many Serbs to have let Serbia down. But one of the ways he did it was by constructing a network of alliances amongst the Balkan states, firstly between Serbia, Bulgaria and Greece, which led to the first Balkan war, which ended in a conclusive defeat for Turkey, and this is in 1912. And then he did the same thing. He, he set up, he, he constructed a new network of alliances, um, which essentially isolated or to some extent marginalised Bulgaria, which had seemed to be the strongest and most successful winner in the Balkan Wars. And of course, that led to a second Balkan War between Greece and Serbia, which led to Bulgaria's defeat. So Hartwig has presided over this series of diplomatic manoeuvres and, and wars which have left Russia's key ally in the Balkans, Serbia, looking suddenly very much stronger. And that, of course, has created a crisis in Vienna because, of course, the, Vienna, the, uh, the, the court in Vienna especially after the Bosnian crisis, sees Serbia now as its implacable enemy. And though Hartwig has been totally successful, and especially after the failure of the German-Russian attempt at reconciliation, which took place in Potsdam, Hartwig has the backing of the Russian political class. What it's done, of course is that it's made Austria feel extremely vulnerable. It's made Austria look even more to Germany for help. It's made the Germans feel that they managed to ruin their relations with Russia. And the result is that you get a sense that Germany and Austria are now combining with each other increasingly against Russia, with the Germans becoming increasingly concerned about the stability of their Austrian ally as R Russia and Serbia become stronger and are out for revenge. And I have to say, to many people, it's increasingly looking as if the battle lines, which were already starting to emerge as a result of the Bosnian crisis, have now been deepened. And we now are in a situation which is beginning to look like almost a pre-war situation. The smallest thing now could tip Europe into war with the Germans and the Austrians feeling vulnerable, feeling that the window is closing, that Russia is gaining strength in the Balkans, that Austria's internal stability is weakening and that Russia's power is growing as the Russian economy is accelerating in strength and as the Russian military grows in power also. And one wonders what's going to happen over the next few years, because the situation, I understand, in Berlin at the moment is well nigh hysterical, with the German Chancellor, Bettmann Holweg, apparently already saying that the Russians are on the march, that they're going to take over his estate in East Prussia, uh, 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 and all sorts of wild talk of that like that and with many Germans increasingly talking about the need for a preemptive war. So, on the one hand, a huge diplomatic success for Russia in the Balkans, uh, uh, a brilliant and decisive revenge for the Bosnian humiliation, but one which may have set the scene for war in Europe. Yeah. I agree with you there. I think uh, the Austrians are definitely, and, and the Germans are definitely feeling like uh, their their backs against the wall and they're getting pushed around, and uh, they're they're looking past. I mean, they're looking at Serbia, but they're looking past Serbia and they're seeing Russia as the country that appears to be coordinating all of this, whether it's true or not. But um, two questions before we get to Rasputin: Alliances are deepening. Where is uh, France and? Uh, and Britain in all of this? Yeah, what position I mean, have they taken? Or are they just remaining silent? And follow-up question, 
the, the Kaiser wouldn't dare start a war with Russia, given the fact that, gosh, I mean, they are family in a way. I mean, uh, Alexander, I believe, is either a first or second cousin. And to be honest, I think Nicholas is also a very distant cousin as well. They wouldn't dare start a war. Or is that what the royal family believes, that Germany wouldn't dare start a, a war with, uh, with family members? You would, you would have thought not. I mean, I would say that relations between Nicholas and Wil Wilhelm have now all but broken down. I mean, one of the things is, I mean, Wil Wilhelm constantly patronises Nicholas in a way that I think Nicholas finds intensely irritating. And they, they also have fundamental differences on art and culture. This is a sort of comical side. But Wil Wilhelm is constantly sending to Nicholas or has been sending to Nicholas really absolutely bizarre and weird paintings, you know, which show uh, Germany and Russia together fighting against the Asiatic horde, things of this kind, which, um, you know, Nicholas really doesn't like. I mean, Nicholas is a very deeply cultured man. He has a he's he's very uh, has a very high aesthetic sensibility he finds he finds Wilhelm bumptious and arrogant and crude but beyond that as I said there's no trust between them because Nicholas feels badly let down by Nicholas by, by Wilhelm over the Bosnian crisis and he feels um, also even more let down by Wilhelm after the failure of the Potsdam conference and you would have thought that Germany, looking at the situation objectively, would say to itself, well, war with Russia, what on earth do we need that for? Yes, our Habsburg friends are getting themselves into trouble, but they're only doing that because we've been egging them on. We've been encouraging them to take decisions in the Balkans, which are completely mistaken. I mean, bear in mind, the only reason Austria was able to humiliate Russia during the Bosnian crisis was because it was aided and abetted by Germany. And, and of course, we've also seen how the Germans meddle by sending advisors and weapons to Turkey, as I said, Russia's enemy. So why the Germans compulsively do this, it's not always easy to understand. But the problem is that within Germany itself, there is a fairly large political grouping and a faction of German society that is viscerally hostile to Russia. It's not always easy to understand why, but if I can speak in very general terms, northeast Russia, G Germany, the areas around Berlin, the old, the old historic Prussia tends to be fairly Russophile Southwest Germany tends to be, on the contrary, intensely Russophobe. And it's that part of Germany, Western Germany, if you like, that seems to be at the moment in the ascendancy. And the, the mood in Germany is becoming increasingly hysterical, uh, uh, with the Germans convinced that the Russians are out to get them, even though, as I said, there's no one in Mos in St. Petersburg who actually wants war with Germany at the present time or need war at all. But this seems to be the sort of obsession which the Germans have. And of course, if you look at the diplomatic disaster that Germany and Austria have just experienced in the Balkans, it's a disaster. It's a debacle which they created themselves as a result of these pointless policies of antagonizing Russia and antagonizing uh, uh, Serbia at the same time. There's some very weird people in Germany at the moment. I mean, you could almost call them a kind of neoconservative faction within the court who uh, have this idea that Germany has this exceptional mission to uh, um, expand itself to pursue what they call Weltpolitik, world policy, to sort of establish Germany as the new world hegemon in replacement to Britain. And many of these people see Russia as standing in the way of this project 
And as I say, they derive their support from a lot of people in southwest Germany, and they have a lot of support from people within the business and commercial community. And my own view is that the influence of these people and their influence on Wilhelm in particular is very strong, that the influence of these people in Germany is extremely dangerous and is leading Germany into some very, very bad decisions. And we see Germany taking belligerent lines and confrontational lines, say with the Balkans, which end up being calamitous for itself. But these people seem to have no reverse gear, and one wonders what will happen eventually and how this will all end and whether they, will, whether they know when to stop. So that's, that's a major concern I have. Uh, the French? The British? Right. Let's talk about the British Where and they the French. Where are they in all this? Let's, let's talk about the British and the French. Well, the British and the French... The British up to now, until fairly recently, wanted to stay out of all of these quarrels. But what they now see is the neoconservatives in Germany, these radical people who think that Germany has this mission. They are talking about displacing the British Empire. They're spending vast sums on building up this enormous fleet to take on the Royal Navy. So the British, who remain the world's most powerful country, are saying to themselves, we have a challenge from Germany. And they're starting, they're increasingly building up alliances in Europe with countries like Russia, like France, which are hostile to Germany. So the British, they're doing this in a very uncertain way because the British have also a visceral antagonism to Russia. But at the moment, because Germany is the bigger rival, they are now working to try to improve their relations with Russia. Some people in Russia, by the way, are very sceptical about this. But the big change has been in France. France, up to fairly recently, has been very antagonistic to Germany. It's wanted a revenge against Germany for the defeat it suffered in the War of 1870, it wants to regain control of the lost territories of Alsace-Lorraine. But at the same time, it's not wanted to side too closely with Russia in Russia's arguments with Austria and over the Balkans. But one senses that sentiment in France is now changing, that the French simultaneously believe that the Germans are becoming too uh, um, aggressive, as I said, with this rise of this sort of neoconservative movement in Germany. And at the same time, they're sensing an opportunity. They're sensing that if relations between Russia and Germany break down and there's a war between these two countries, that's France's chance. That's the moment for France to strike and to gain its much-desired re revenge over Germany and to regain Alsace-Lorraine. So what is happening is that over the last few years, the French seem to be strengthening their alliance with Russia, and they seem to be also moving to develop relations with Serbia and to build up, harden, if you like, this alliance between, with Russia and France against Germany. So what German policy is doing is it's strengthening the alliances against them. It's creating a policy, a situation where Germany suffers successive foreign policy defeats and debacles, and at the same time is combining all the other great powers against it, except for Austria, which is, of course, looking increasingly weak and unstable. Oh, boy. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'll go back. They're celebrating the 300 years. But um, my, my gut tells me that uh, when the celebration is over and done with, you're going to have the mother of all hangovers. <laughs> for, uh, I, I, for Russia I, and for I, the world. <laughs> Maybe you have the mother of all parties taking place now. But I think you're going to have the mother of all hangovers. I think you're absolutely right. And I, I say a few things. First of all, the economy is booming. Agricultural expansion is increasing. But there are increasing signs that this boom 
may be running, coming to to something like an end. Firstly, what we see is that an awful lot of this boom is being uh, propelled by, quite honestly, reckless debt issuance. Reckless debt issuance on the part of the government itself, reckless debt issuance on the part of many Russian businesses and companies. And one does wonder how much longer that can, can continue for. Also, the boom is now grow uh, inflating the value of russian assets to such an extent that what it's what it's also doing is it's in sucking in imports so that one gets a sense that russia's trade surplus which used to be quite strong is is actually rapidly diminishing and that the country will very soon be in deficit so we have increasing debts increasing prospects of a deficit, both in, you know, the trade position and in the uh, budget, all whilst Russia remains within the gold standard, which makes any attempt to try to gain, regain competitiveness, competitiveness through a devaluation impossible. So, you know, I worry, and I know many people worry, that this boom has perhaps a year or two left, but then we could very well find ourselves in, 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 a, in a deep recession. But beyond that, looking beyond the boom itself, the underlying problems within the fault lines within Russian society are still there. The liberals remain completely unreconciled. I think they are unreconcilable. I've already said how they've used the Lena Goldfield crisis in order to discredit Nicholas. And um, they still are very influential in the Duma. They still control the media to all intents and purposes in Russia. And they still manipulate these revolutionary groups, especially now the Bolsheviks, who are gaining traction increasingly with large parts of the Russian working class. And I think actually Nicholas is actually fairly well informed about all of this. But I think he is, he finds it very difficult to respond to this effectively. P partly, it must be said, because of faults within his own personality, he is a very shy, very diffident man. He's not the sort of person who dominates those around him in the way that his father used to do. And at the same time, the government itself is deeply dysfunctional and there are many people in it who are deeply uh, uh, influenced by liberal thinking. One example, for example, is, the, is Prince uh, Nikolai, Nikolaevich, who has managed to leverage himself into a position where he's now, in effect, supreme commander of the Russian military. And he's known to be hand in glove with the liberals. He is, in fact been dropping hints that he thinks that he should be Tsar, he's make a better Tsar than Nicholas would, and if he does become Tsar, he will give the Liberals much of what they want. So you can see that there are these problems within the court, within the government itself, and Nicholas has never really been able to overcome them. He's never been able to streamline the government to the extent of controlling it himself. He relied on Stolypin to do it for him. But of course, Stolypin is gone. Yeah, well, the other problem that Nicholas has, I think it's a problem, and a lot of people in Russia think it's a problem, is that of, uh, of Rasputin. And Nicholas hasn't fully been able to, to deal with the Rasputin problem because his wife, from what I understand, sources that I have, are telling me that she's just become completely dependent on uh, and attached to Rasputin, but not in the way that much of the media is reporting. And I would like you to get to that because I understand why she's so dependent on Rasputin or why she believes uh, the family needs Rasputin, much of it to do with, with Alexei. But, um, and Nicholas... For some reason in his head, he feels like, you know what, 
better for, for Rasputin to be there than for me to get rid of Rasputin than for me to find a way to deal with, with my wife's anguish and my wife's, uh, uh, it, it, it seems like she does border on, on, on panic and neurosis at times without, uh, without Rasputin. But it, it is understandable when you understand Alexei's condition, at least from what I understand his condition is. I know the royal family tries to keep it uh, quiet. There's that issue, but the, the, the Rasputin that the, uh, the media is reporting on and we got the bombshell from his, uh, from his buddy, who once was his buddy, <laughs> once was his pal, and now seems like it's his enemy, uh, Iliodor. What they're reporting is uh, letters that Iliodor got from Rasputin, which paint a picture of, uh, of many illicit things happening between the royal family and Rasputin. And uh, I, I can understand when you manipulate these, uh, these letters and take them out of context like the media does, the fake news media, how they do it all the time. Um, you paint a very terrible picture, but it's, it's a different picture. It's not what the media is reporting. But nonetheless, my point is it's still damaging the czar. Yes. And it is still making the people angry. And then you throw in, real quick, Alexander, then you throw in the fact that you have this tension with Germany and the fact that the czar's wife is uh, of German heritage you, this 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 is gonna this is gonna blow up in uh, in everyone's face in the royal family yeah. all of this the way the it, the media is going to manipulate this it, it's a train wreck that everybody can see and is pointing out to nicholas all the time i mean he's been told this by people like Akovsev, the prime minister he was told this by stalipin he's been told this by any number of people that he's got to get nick uh, rasputin out of the palace, he's got to send him back to Siberia, where he came from, uh, and never allow him back. Everybody is telling Nicholas this, and unfortunately, Nicholas doesn't seem to be able to prevail over his wife and to get her to understand this. Now, Alexandra has become very psychologically dependent on Rasputin. Clearly, the fact that her son is apparently has some kind of illness the court is very reluctant to share with us what it is, but that's created it's huge... Haemophilia. is the rumour, that he's got some that's kind of blood condition. Uh, exactly. And that Rasputin is apparently able to help Nicola, uh, uh, Alexei through these, through, through these episodes. Th that seems to have played a major role in, 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 in this bond that exists between Alexandra and Rasputin. I have to say, I think that there is another reason, and that is the fact that the Empress Dowager, who, as I said, is uh, uh, Nicholas's mother, who is, as I said, now quite obviously and openly working with the Liberals against her own son, um, so obviously detests her and has managed to isolate Alexandra within the court. So given that she feels isolated, in this country, which remember she's a, you know she's a foreigner in ultimately. I mean she's she's learnt Russian. She's immersed herself in Russian things. She's deeply uh, devout in Orthodox Christianity. But the fact that the court and society is so hostile to her and has been so turned against her means that she's becoming exceptionally over dependent on this one man. Rasputin, who unfortunately it seems she's also come to link, to think of, as a link between herself and the Russian people. You know, he's a peasant, so he, she thinks that, you know, he's somehow somebody who can tell her what the peasants, what the people, the mass of the people are thinking. Whether Rasputin really is in any position to tell her any such thing, that's another matter. But Alexandra believes that. And she resists every attempt by officials close to Nicholas and indeed by Nicholas himself. Nicholas has tried to send Rasputin away, but whenever it happens, there's a huge uproar in the palace. And as Nicholas apparently has said himself, better have Rasputin than around than endless weeks of hysterics. That's how he's expressed it. Now, I think he's making 
a colossal mistake because there's a number of things that we're now beginning to learn increasingly about Rasputin. The first is that he's a compulsive womanizer. And, you know, I'm, I'm, being, I'm being extremely measured in what I say here. But, I mean, he's, he's, he's having, he has relationships with lots of women all the time. He's also, I'm afraid, a person who frequents places of ill repute and has liaisons. And brothels. And brothels. <laughs> and, uh, 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 you know, places like, um, you know, um, very sleazy nightclubs. Russia has lots of those, by the way. And he, he gets involved with all sorts of things of this kind. He's often drunk. He's often seen drunk in public in the company of these sort of people. And what is most damaging of all is that he's now starting, as a result of his influence on Alexandra, to apparently exercise some influence on appointments, not important people, at least not so far, but people on the margins of the government. He's able to get various people appointed to positions. And um, he takes bribes from them. <laughs> I mean, I think this is, you know, now becoming increasingly well documented. So this is, this is, frankly, a person who is not someone you want to have around. Now, what has happened is that he got involved, Rasputin got involved briefly with this individual who calls himself, or used to call himself, Iliodor. Iliodor was some kind, of, was a priest in the Orthodox Church, though not a very good one. And he projected himself as being on the extreme far right of Russian politics. Somebody, you know, who feels that Russia should be run, you know, as a total unalloyed autocracy. Um, by the way, I am very sceptical whether Iliodor really believed any of those things. He now parades. He, he's now uh, uh, left the Orthodox Church and has been defrocked and uh, now claims to be an extreme liberal, by the way. But all right, we won't go into that. But Rasputin briefly became very close to this person. And Iliodor used that to steal some letters that Alexandra wrote to Rasputin, including one letter in particular in which um, it discusses a place where uh, Rasputin and the Empress would meet, you know, one of their usual rendezvous, which is the residence of, uh, of, of a lady-in-waiting called uh, Anna Virubova. Now, Anna Viruba is an extremely decent, very proper person, absolutely not somebody to preside over any kind of illicit liaison. And anybody who knows the relationship between Nicholas and Alexandra knows that it is completely solid. But the way in which this letter has been used is to make it, make it look as if Alexandra is having illicit meetings with Rasputin, Rasputin, of course, is this notorious philanderer, womanizer, man of who you know goes to brothels and other houses of in ill repute, and he's having these meetings, these illicit, supposedly illicit, secret meetings with the emperors. Now you have to read the letter in a very twisted way in order to see that. But, of course, people like Kerensky, the sort of people I was talking about, are absolutely game for that sort of thing. They're, of course, the kind of people who will twist the meaning of these letters. And the fact that the court, the palace, is very reticent about Alexei's illness and isn't explaining one of the reasons why Alexandra and Rasputin meet makes it very easy to, it makes it very easy to imply that there is a particular reason why they're meeting, which is obviously the one that people are saying. And what's starting to happen is that all sorts of hideous cartoons are being circulated, which so Rasputin as Alexan and Alexandra as lovers, and they're being spread across the villages 
and in the factories by the revolutionary parties, undoubtedly, again, with the help of the Liberals. And, of course, it's doing enormous damage because, of course, one of the things it's doing is, if you think of Russia, it's still a conservative society. People look up to the Tsar. They expect the Tsar to be a man who runs his own household, who keeps his wife in check. The image of the Tsar that's being represented as of a weak man dominated by his wife, who is at the same time dominated by this sinister figure and who's having uh, Rasputin and is having a relationship with him. It's an absolute gift to the Tsar's enemies and the Liberals are using it for all it's worth. They've even come up with a way of referring to Rasputin in the newspapers. They call him the Dark Forces. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and actually, I- I- Iliodor is, <laughs> is telling the media that he's putting together a book as well with, uh, with more letters and, and things. Exactly. I mean, I, I'm, quite convinced. I'm quite convinced, really by the way, wreck. that he, the, the liberals are running him. I think they were running him when he was a, supposedly an arch conservative. I think they've been running him all, all the time, actually. Well, um, but, but the there story we go. is that, that yeah. yeah, the story is, I mean, him and Rasputin were, were buddies and, and they had a falling out. But the story is that he got jealous because Rasputin did manage to get into the, the royal family circle yeah. where he couldn't. So, I mean, he's these are two good friends who are getting revenge one against the other it seems but i mean yeah. he, he he fired a bomb yeah. uh with these uh with these letters being released absolutely against Rasputin and the royal family absolutely now I, I mean i should say that as i said i i am more suspicious of this man Iliodor, as, as he used to call himself than most people are i i I, just, I think he was a provocateur right the way through and i suspect that this so-called friendship with Rasputin was simply a way of somebody getting close to him. And as I said, I mean, friends don't steal letters from each other. <laughs> That's not what they do. So, I mean, I, 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 I think this was an operation right from the start. And it's proving incredibly effective. I, was just, it, it's, I know many people in the court are in despair about this and are, 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 are constantly trying to tell the, the Tsar that this is a disastrous situation and that he's simply lending um, weight to what his enemies have to say about him. And, of course, in the countryside, it, it, it's having a disastrous effect. I mean, you know, the, the peasants have been told that the Tsar, the Tsar of all the Russias, that the little father, the father of all the, the nations, is being cuckolded, to put it mildly, he, he's, his wife... It is unfaithful to him. I mean, the effect this is having on the sort of conservative attitudes in the countryside is just is just unspeakable. But the Tsar doesn't seem to have any ability to deal with this. And um, it's unfortunately doing now an increasing amount of damage. Uh, and that's very bad, given how complicated the political situation is in Russia itself and how complicated the international situation is becoming. I mean, Nicholas doesn't need this. He doesn't need the damage it's doing, and he doesn't need the stress that it must be causing him as well. Yeah, it is a perfect storm that's brewing. He's just got to get rid of Rasputin. I mean, yeah. it's just just get rid of him. Yeah. Just get rid of him, because it's a, it's a huge, huge problem in the making. Anyway, we'll, uh, we'll leave it there, um, and uh, we'll report on some more news as we get it. TheDuran.Locals.com, everybody. Take care.